Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. In the U.S., 877 people have died from COVID-19, while over 67,000 infected in the last 24 hours. The country's death toll has crossed 140,000 with over 3.7 million infections. In Pakistan, 31 people have died overnight, taking the death toll to nearly 5,600 with over 265,000 cases. The global death toll from the new coronavirus has passed 605,000 with more than 14.4 million infection cases. Unprovoked Indian ceasefire violation along the line of control has critically wounded a 20-year-old civilian. Pakistan military's media wing says the Indian forces a targeted civil population in the Baksa sector. It said Pakistan's armed forces responded to the Indian aggression effectively. In Afghanistan, the government says that the Taliban have killed 12 Afghan troops during attacks in northern Kunduz and Baghdad province. It said eight security personnel were killed in an attack on a security post in Kunduz, while four were killed in clashes in Baghdad. The Taliban have claimed the responsibility for the Kunduz attack. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. In the US, 877 people have died from COVID-19, while over 67,000 infected in the last 24 hours. The country's death toll has crossed 140,000 with over 3.7 million infections. The global death toll from the new coronavirus has passed 605,000 with more than 14.4 million infection cases. More in this report. Governments around the world are eyeing tougher steps to fight COVID-19 as its second wave rages across the world. Since late June, the U.S. has seen a resurgence in new cases and now, five weeks later, America is losing about 5,000 people to the virus every week. In Brazil, 716 more have died, increasing the toll to over 79,000 with nearly 2.1 million cases. Despite that, just after recovering from the virus, Brazil's President Gerald Bolsonaro joined hundreds of supporters outside his residence, flogging global guidelines. In many parts of the world, ignoring stay-at-home calls, people continue to flay guidelines, risking community transmission. Some beaches, they're keeping their distance. The other restaurant, it was full. So I think it's... Everybody's doing what they want. And I think the government's risking by putting everything in the control of the people. Um, I think they need to take stricter measures, make it safe, make the virus go away, and then properly open the border. In Hong Kong, banks have closed their branches across the city-state, edging towards another round of lockdowns after a virus spike. But in China, Beijing has announced to lower its emergency response to COVID-19 from level 2 to level 3. The risk of the spreading virus to other parts from Beijing is relatively low and the epidemic situation is stable and under control. The conditions are in place to lower the response level from 2 to 3. More than 5,000 have died in Africa's hardest-hit country, South Africa, with tens of thousands contracting the disease every day. Pakistan has reported 31 deaths from COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, raising the total to nearly 6,000. The health ministry says 1,587 new cases were reported overnight as the tally crossed 265,000. Officials said over 205,000 people have recovered from the virus so far. The ministry said there are now over 53,000 active cases in the country, among which 1,552 are in critical condition. Sindh is the worst hit 
province with over 113,000 infections, while Punjab has reported over 90,000 cases. The Pakistan Army says unprovoked Indian fighting has wounded a 20-year-old civilian in the Baksa sector along the line of control. In a statement, the military's media wing said Pakistani troops effectively responded to Indian aggression. Indian troops have committed nearly 1,700 ceasefire violations this year so far. Islamabad has time and again asked in New Delhi to respect the 2003 ceasefire agreement between the two countries. Kabul claims that the Taliban have killed 12 Afghan troops in the attacks in northern Kunduz and northwest Badghis province. A spokesperson to Kunduz governor says eight security personnel were killed in an attack on a post on Kunduz Ali Abad district highway. He said two others were wounded in the raid while the Taliban also suffered casualties. Meanwhile, Badghis governor spokesperson said four soldiers were killed in clashes with the Taliban. Claiming responsibility for the Kunduz attack, Taliban spokesperson persons of Yola Majahid said the group also destroyed two tanks of the Afghan forces. Wrangling EU leaders will meet again today after they failed to agree on a $2 trillion COVID-19 recovery fund and seven-year budget. The summit was initially scheduled for just two days but has been pushed to the fourth day due to disagreement over the fund size and the mode of distribution. After the adjournment of the talks was announced, both the Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz and Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte said progress was being made. Rutte said talks have been close to failing, but European Council President Charles Michel's new compromised proposal may bear fruits. With pandemic dealing Europe its worst economic shock since World War II, EU leaders are expected to reach an agreement to jumpstart economies. Iraq says four ISIS militants and two uh, paramilitary Hashd Shabi members have been killed in two attacks in Saladin province. In a statement, the government-backed Hashd Shabi forces said the ISIS fighters were killed in an operation in Samara city. Meanwhile, a roadside bomb exploded on Hashd Shabi vehicle during an anti-ISIS operation in Al Jazeera area. The statement said the explosion destroyed the vehicle and killed two members and wounded four others aboard. Turkey says it has killed four militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in air strikes during Operation Claw Tiger in northern Iraq. The National Defense Ministry said the military carried out operations backed by air power in the Haftanin region. The ministry said Turkey will continue to destroy weapon caches and shelters used by the terrorists. It said over 400 Kurdish militants have been killed in northern Iraq over the past five months. State media said PKK militants often use northern Iraq to plan cross-border terrorist attacks in Turkey. Turkey holds the PKK responsible for the deaths of some 40,000 people in a 30-year conflict. Jordan says the Israeli annexation of the Palestinian territories will have catastrophic repercussions on efforts to achieve peace in the region. In a statement, Foreign Minister Eman Safadi said the annexation will undermine the hopes of a two-state solution of the conflict. Talking about the Libyan crisis, Safadi underlined Jordan's support for all the efforts to reach a political solution to end the conflict. He said Jordan supports all UN resolutions about reaching a settlement by Libyans themselves. Safadi said the outcomes of the Berlin Conference and the Cairo Declaration should be implemented in the country. Nigeria says it has killed eight senior members of Boko Haram in northeastern Borno province. Defense Ministry spokesman John Enenche said an airstrike targeted Boko Haram in the Goski village. The spokesperson said numerous shelters used by the Boko Haram and logistic materials were also destroyed during the operation. Boko Haram launched a terrorist campaign in northeastern Nigeria in 2009, but later spread to neighboring Niger, Chad and Cameroon. The UN says more than 30,000 people have been killed and nearly 3 million displaced in a decade of Boko Haram's violence. 
British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the UK's extradition deal with Hong Kong will be changed amid rising tensions with China. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab will confirm the move later in a statement to the parliament. It comes days after Beijing imposed a national security law on the ex-British colony. The UK has already offered residency rights to three million Hong Kongers in response. China has accused the UK of brutal meddling in its internal affairs. Beijing insists it is committed to upholding international law and has promised a response if the UK withdraws from extradition deals. Australia says it is scrutinizing Chinese-owned social media applications, citing national security concerns. In an interview, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said his government will not be shy about banning the app if it finds any proofs against it. Chairwoman of inquiry into foreign interference through social media, Senator Jenny McAllister says some approaches of moderating content might be inconsistent with the Australian values. In a letter to Australian politicians, TikTok's regional official said the app is independent and not aligned with any government. Iran's judiciary has executed a man convicted of spying for the U.S. and Israeli intelligence agencies. Mahmoud Musavi Majid was arrested in 2018 over the charge of espionage. The judiciary last month said Majid had spied to former Iranian commander Qasem Soleimani. However, it said the case was not directly connected to the top general's assassination earlier this year. Soleimani was assassinated in a U.S. drone strike in Iraq earlier this year. Washington accuses Soleimani of masterminding attacks by Iran-aligned militias on U.S. forces in the region. U.S. superstar rapper Kanye West has officially launched his campaign for 2020 presidential election. The 43-year-old is running as a candidate for his self-styled birthday party. Addressing an unorthodox rally in Charleston, South Carolina, the rapper shared what appeared to be off-the-cuff policy decisions. Fans have questioned whether Kenya's last-minute bid for the White House is actually a promotional stunt. A now deleted tweet is sent from West's account, appearing to show the song list for a new album added to the speculation. West announced his candidacy on July the 4th, but has already missed the deadline to qualify for the ballot in several states. He needs to collect enough signatures to appear on the ballot in a number of others. In the U.S. organizers of national workers' strike say thousands plan on walking off jobs in two dozen cities to protest racism and economic inequality today. The organizer of the strike for black lives says the movement is building a country where the black lives matter in every aspect of society, including the workplace. The chief organizer, Ashley Henderson Henderson, said labor unions, along with social and racial justice organizations, will participate in a range of planned actions. She said participants will either picket during a lunch break or observe moments of silence where work stoppages are not possible for a full day. Strikers demand sweeping actions by corporates and government to end racism and economic equality for the black and Hispanic workers. In the U.S., one person has been killed and eight others injured after three men opened fire on a busy street in Washington, D.C. Washington's police chief says a woman was among nine adults taken to a hospital where one was declared dead. He said a manhunt is underway for the three assailants who were carrying long guns and a pistol. Separately, the son of the federal judge has been shot and killed at his home in New Jersey. Her husband was also wounded in the shooting. It's time for a short break. We'll be back. Welcome back. In India, violent protests have erupted in West Bengal after the gang rape and murder of a teenager. Angry demonstrators burned police vehicles and passenger buses after the body of a 17-year-old girl was found near a field. Horrific gang rape incidents have rocked India over the years. In this latest episode, angry demonstrators chanted slogans against the police and demanded justice for the girl. Police fired tear gas and resorted to baton charge. 
to disperse the crowd who blocked the national highway. The government data shows that one woman reported a rape every 15 minutes on an average with 34,000 rapes only in 2018. Floods following torrential monsoon rains in Bangladesh marooned about 2.3 million people in 18 districts. Disaster Management Ministry says flood water is still flowing above the danger mark at 22 points in different districts across the country. It said at least eight people have been killed by floods which have affected people of 523 unions. Meanwhile, crops worth over $40 million have also been damaged by the floods and further losses in tens of thousands of farmers are feared. Agricultural Department officials said growers in 14 districts suffered the biggest losses as the floods submerged nearly 42,000 hectares of land. Dhaka says it has opened over a thousand centers in the districts where at least 47,000 adults and nearly 13,000 children have taken shelter. Saudi Arabia's King Salman bin Abdulaziz has been admitted to a hospital in the capital city of Riyadh. The Saudi state media says the king is undergoing further medical checks after being diagnosed with gallbladder inflammation. 84-year-old Salman has ruled since 2015 and is the custodian of the Islam's holiest sites. He spent more than two and a half years as the Saudi crown prince and deputy premier before becoming the king. He also served as governor of Riyadh region for more than 50 years. 34-year-old Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is the next in line for the throne and serves as the kingdom's de facto ruler. Pakistan's JF-17 Thunder aircraft has for the first time participated in the virtual air tattoo show 2020 at the UK's Royal Air Force Base, Fairford. Other than number 16 squadron, the time-tested C-130 Hercules from number 21 squadron also participated in the mega event. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, air forces from all over the world were asked to send short video clips of the participating aircraft and air crew. Pakistan Air Force's video over telecast on the official social media handles of RIAT and were widely appreciated. Ranked among the biggest air shows of the world, RIAT features the aircraft from leading air forces across the globe. Various air forces, aircraft manufacturers, aerospace technology firms participate in the mega show every year. The UAE has become the first Arab nation to launch a mission to Mars. The unmanned 200-day mission blasted off from Japan's Tanigashima Island, joining the US and China for similar attempts. It will separate from its H-2A rocket and begin the 200-day journey towards the Red Planet. The mission's approval came after weeks of heavy rain and postponements on July the 15 and 17. UAE officials say the mission has cost $200 million. It aims to provide a complete picture of the Martian atmosphere for the first time, studying daily and seasonal changes. There are currently eight active missions exploring Mars. Some orbit the planet and some have landed on its surface. After the success of drive-in cinemas during social distancing restrictions amid COVID-19, Paris turns to the River Seine in a float-in cinema. What about the streaming cinema in this report? In Paris, film fans can now munch on their popcorn watching a movie while drifting over the River Seine. People aboard 38 electric boats were treated to a free showing of the 2018 French comedy Le Grand Bain. Each boat can seat up to six people who know each other. Others can watch from deck chairs as the screen floats over the Seine. I'm super excited. It's a really unique opportunity. I've never seen anything like this in Paris, so super excited. This is a part of the six-week summer festival Paris Plages. Organizers hope to hold similar showings during the course of the festival. Although cinemas have reopened in France, occupancy levels remain very low because of the COVID-19 protocols for social distancing. This serene summer fiesta's open sky cinema was thoroughly enjoyed by movie fans. I really enjoy open air cinema. It marks the beginning of the summer and even if we are already in mid July, for me it marks the beginning of the Persian adventures. I really enjoy the idea of boats associating the Seine River with a movie on water. I didn't want to miss this. 
Paris Plage, a summer fiesta launched in 2002, creates artificial beaches on the banks of the Seine in central Paris and the Bassin de la Villette. It also offers sporting opportunities such as fencing, giant table football and open-air gyms looking out over the Seine. Well, the European stock markets are trading lower after EU leaders failed to agree on a multi-billion euro recovery fund and budget. Investor sentiments dampened as failure to reach a deal dented hopes of a revival of economic activity. London's FTSE 100 is trading nearly 1% lower. CAC 40 in Paris has lost three quarters of a percent. Frankfurt's DAX is trading fractionally lower. In Asia, Shanghai Composite gained 3%, while Nikkei 225 closed marginally higher. Seoul's Kospi Index and Nikkei 225 closed marginally lower. Meanwhile, international benchmark Brent crude oil prices lost over half a percent. Starting the world of sports with cricket, England have declared their second innings at 129 for three in the second test match against West Indies at Old Trafford. On the final day, the visitors need 312 runs to win. In reply, West Indies lost three quick wickets in a shaky start. Stuart Broad picked two wickets, while Chris Vokes picked one to decimate the visitors' top order. Earlier, Ben Stokes scored a quick 550 of 36 balls to extend the host's lead. And in football, Chelsea beat Manchester United by three goals to one in the semi-finals of the FA Cup at the Wembley Stadium. The Blues will now meet Arsenal in the final on the 1st of August. The Red Devils dish their usual FA Cup keeper Sergio Romero to keep faith with David De Gea. But the Spanish international produced two horrendous errors either side of the half-time to gift Chelsea two goals. De Gea flimsy attempt to stop Olivia Giroud's flick in the first half stoppage time gave Chelsea the lead. Harry Maguire's late on goal put an end to all hopes of a comeback for United. Football star Lionel Messi has won his seventh La Liga Golden Boot after scoring twice in Barcelona's win over Alves on the final day. Playing at Mendes Rota Stadium, Barcelona concluded their season with a 5-0 victory. Messi finished on 25 goals, four clear of Real Madrid striker Karim Benzema. This is the first time La Liga's top scorer has managed fewer than 30 goals since Mallorca's Daniel Guiza 12 years ago. Barca next host Napoli in the Champions League last 16 second leg on 8th of August, having drawn one all in Italy. Meanwhile, Bournemouth are on the verge of relegation after losing to local rivals Southampton. The Saints beat struggling Bournemouth 2-0 at the Vitality Stadium. Danny Ings opened the scoring for the Saints four minutes before the half-time whistle. G. Adams blasted in the second to complete an agonizing few minutes for Bournemouth. They will be relegated on Tuesday if Watford get a point against Manchester City or if the Hornets get one against Arsenal on the final day. In another fixture, Tottenham Hotspur thrashed Leicester City 3-0 at home. Jose Mourinho's side move up to the sixth in the table, two points clear of Wolves. And now the weather situation from around the globe. And that is all for now for the latest updates. You can follow us on social media at Indistort News.